recording the meeting now. So the meeting is being recorded. Uh, one thing you can do if you are feeling up to it, you can rename yourself in the participants window. Uh, you can find your name and then uh, click on the more button, rename yourself with your organization if you like. In the chat box, you can use this for asking quick clarifying questions, something maybe you misheard or, or uh, just want a tiny bit of clarification that somebody else in the chat might be able to answer, um, or for tech support. And then using the uh, reactions and nonverbal feedback, so you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom bar or your little green guy that you have to hover over, if you click on that participants uh, tab, you can get some different options of saying yes or no. Um, and then you can also go to the reactions if you just want a nice little hands clap or a thumbs up. And so for, uh, for the Q&A, we're going to be using something called Slido. So if you go to slido.com, or actually I'm going to give you a link directly to the Slido event, so you can go straight to it, or you can use slido.com and join with Salmon. Uh, and this is just what we're, work we're gonna use for uh, collecting questions and answers for later. So it should be live and you can start putting questions in. This allows people to upvote questions. Uh, and so feel free to start putting questions in during the presenter's uh, topics. And that's just like a little bit of a breakdown of what it'll look like when you get in there. You also notice there's an ideas section where uh, I've posted one topic that's about what future solutions workshops could be. Uh, so feel free to pop your ideas in there at any time as well. Uh, so we're also going to use a poll today just to find out who's in the room with us. So I'm sending a poll to you now. It should pop up in your Zoom screen. And you have uh, an option to choose what type of organization and you might be multiple so you can pick multiple if that applies to you and then where you're joining from today all right thanks everyone it looks like we've got a whole lot of responses. So, all right, local government is uh, is taking it. Here we go. Lots of local government folks showing up today, and then a, a pretty good mix. One lonely regional government, uh, and mostly from the Lower Mainland, uh, and some from across Canada. Oh. Right, I didn't share the results with you. Here we go, there's the results. All right, so that gives you a sense of who's in the room today. All right, I'll kick along into a little bit of a Resilient Waters update. For those that don't know, Resilient Waters is a project that's working to support opportunities to improve flood control infrastructure along the lower Fraser River uh, from Richmond to Hope to allow fish passage. Uh, and this is really with a double, the multi-pronged kind of idea that we can both restore habitat and migration routes for salmon, as well as help communities prepare for flooding, especially with climate change impacts. This is a project of Make Way. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Make Way is a nonprofit that recently changed its name. It was Ides Canada. And last week, it changed its name to Make Way. So I've uh, provided a couple of links about who and what Make Way does. Um, uh, some of you might be familiar with Tides Canada, but I know that some of you might not be as well. So I won't go into too much detail about that. I'll just say that uh, on our team, Resilient Waters is uh, Kerwood Lydell uh, and Patrick Lilly, who is a salmon biologist with, with them, uh, and Mike Pearson, who is also a salmon biologist. Uh, with Pearson Ecological, uh, and between Patrick and Mike, they have over 30 years of experience working on these kinds of issues in the Lower Fraser. 
Uh, I'll also say that this project is uh, funded by the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, along with the Pacific Salmon Foundation. And it's really inspired by work that was done by Watershed Watch. Uh, and if you follow this link that I'll pop into the chat, uh, is a report from a workshop that uh, Watershed Watch put on last year, which was a two-day workshop that really gets into the, the technical and governance and legal and jurisdictional aspects uh, of flood control and fish passage from a um, from a very intersectoral or cross-sectoral lens. I'm also very happy to announce that as of this morning, and let's see how fast I can get this up. Uh, we do have a working online map now. So this will just take me one second as I get the map ready. So if you go to our website, resilientwaters.ca, you'll be able to see our brand new map that was helped produced with uh, Kerwood Lydell. Oh, okay, well, we're having a bit of problems here. There we go, it's loading up. And this map uh, shows the, the sites that we've been working on. You know what, I think my internet is not gonna allow this too much. <laughs> So I think what I'm going to do is just show you what I've got in my presentation screen instead. Yeah. So we've basically come down. If you do go to our website, resilientwaters.ca, there is a map there that has all of this information on it, and it's up to date and current. It shows 25 different sites that we've identified that uh, we're working on in different ways uh, to prioritize some of these pieces of flood infrastructure. Um, and we're very happy to talk with anyone that's on the call today more about these opportunities. We've been having lots of conversations now with uh, folks that are involved in these uh, and happy to talk with anyone about any opportunities that are uh, arriving for them. So I won't uh, belabor that point too much. Also say that uh, one of the funner things we're doing is working with the Case Lockman at the UBC Coastal Adaptation Lab uh, to work on some of the visualizations of the problem and some of the solution structures around floodgates and pump stations and dikes. This is just uh, an example of an animation that we've had made preliminarily of a uh, top mounted, of the dreaded top mounted gate. I'm sure uh, our experts here in the room today have opinions on how this might be a correct uh, visualization or not. So we'll be interested to hear more feedback on that. And before we get into our presentations, I just wanna say quickly, so why did we even do a solutions workshop? And it became quite apparent that we have a very good sense of why uh, this is a problem, fish passage and flood control infrastructure. But what's less clear is what the solutions really are. And there is a real lack of uh, scientific monitoring, at least. Uh, it, and especially in the lower Fraser River. So uh, it really inspired us to look uh, around the world to see where folks are having success and where they're looking at this in a more rigorous way. Uh, and, not, and also potentially to kind of hear from the, the local perspectives on folks that are doing this as well. Uh, and that are seeing it more anecdotally. So with that, I want to hand it over to Ernie Victor for our first presentation uh, and his perspective. So Ernie Victor is a member of Chiam First Nation and fisheries manager with Stolo Nation Research and Resource Management Center. Uh, he also supports a variety of businesses and organizations that work positively for water and fish. His passion is understanding water and salmon in a variety of different ways and doesn't see us changing anytime soon. And Ernie also loves to bring ways of living and understanding the world to youthful minds. So Ernie, it's over to you. Well, thank you, Dan. And thank you for that, um, all the details and information you've provided from um, through this, through this uh, <clears throat> online presentation. 
I appreciate the, the maps and everything. Um, I better get going before I get done. <laughs> so, um, I'd just like to, you know, thank everyone for signing up and being a part of this. Um, this is kind of new for me to, to, to do a presentation here. I apologize, my event's not working on my computer, so I'll have to do this verbally to, to, and share what I have to share with, um, with our participants. Um, Resilient Waters, is, it's a fascinating name because uh, water is, is, uh, is, is, is absolutely resilient and adaptable. Um, as we know from, a, from our Indigenous perspective, you know, we, we, had in, we have um, a lot of sacred agreements with, uh, with different types of life forces, whether it's trees or animals or, or birds or fish and, and, mix, and water, air, you know. So, and, and these sacred agreements that we have had uh, in the past with uh with with these different types of life forces you know always ended up with with us humans being being the ones that need the the other life force the life force doesn't need us the water doesn't need us but the we need the water and th this is how we we have this principle within our co-sailist culture that 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 t talks about um uh equality equality in life force not one life force is is higher than another um, humans are are are, are <clears throat> you know are more needy than than any other type of life force on this world, and that's that's a that's a critical point in in one of in one of our ways, one of our principles. Um, oh my gosh, I have a my apologies here. I have someone ding dong at my door. Um, so I just have a hold on a sec. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so get so back to the Coast Sailors worldview and when it comes to water. Um, now, if you don't if you're not familiar with who the Coast Sailors are, we have a fairly big core territory. The territory extends from probably as far as um, up to Nanus, which is just past Nanaimo, across over to Slyamon onto the mainland, and then down south as far as Seattle, and then half of up towards Victoria. So that's kind of and then around Hope and the Fraser Canyon. So if you know where those places are, that's kind of where our generic culture is. Um, we have a lot, a lot of same language, same culture, same beliefs, and the worldview is fairly similar in this particular area, in that geographic region. That's who the Kusilis are. We have many tribes within it. Um, our language is, is called Halkamalem. Um, our particular people here, the Stalo, are, are in the lower Fraser River. Um, we, we are we are river people and we like to fish, right? So a lot of our principles and teachings that we have that come from the land come from our relationship with salmon and water. Um, there, there's a there's a quote in the past made by Chief um, uh, Swally, and he was he was making a quote about about the treatment of of salmon, and he was petitioning the the governor in the time in the late 1800s about about how how it was unfair for for us to have to pull down our weirs and our fishing techniques. We had, you know, tw over 20 different types of fishing techniques and and uh, very sustainable type of fishing techniques um, that that were he'd been here for a long time. But we had to we had to pull our fishing techniques down. But yet there was there was uh, other contraptions going up, putting you know to stop the stopping flood and um, um, issues that that were. You know, their draining of the of the Sumas Lake and all these big changes that were happening in the Lower Fraser, and the the petition led by this chief at the time was was um, was not only for his people and us to have salmon, but it was also for the salmon itself, and that was that was a big gesture. And and I don't think we picked up on this this kind of gesture as First Nations people until recently in the last in the last um, you know couple decades that we're getting more involved with with um, with uh, what's what's stopping our salmon from flowing into into their into their into their traditional territory, I guess you could say. Um, there was there was a uh, one circumstance, and I, I, one of the presenters here might be familiar with the, the Serpent, Serpentine River, and um, like that, that flows just down by White Rock in in that area towards Surrey, and. We're we're. I got a phone call from an elder, and there was there was a whole bunch of chum salmon, 
and they were trying to get into into this floodgate and the floodgate was closed because the tide was high and, and just so happened that the chum were head trying to head up but the gate was closed and so there was a good 30 30 chums stuck at this gate and at that time so we gathered a bunch of people and we we're packing the chum over and putting them into the into the other side of the of the um of the system in in these little water boxes and that that really struck me quite quite hard as a first nations person and 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 also my 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 brothers from down in Semiama which is in White Rock and that not realizing you know the instinct of of this particular life force is being stopped and inhibited by by something that's protecting human human values and and that, and gratefully so you know right now we have a predominant population of um of uh westerners and 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 where we build our homes contemporarily are on floodplains and areas that 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 aren't safe for houses so therefore with these infrastructures come in and 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 you know cause a little bit of issues with with uh with other types of life forces so that that point this this probably happened about 20 years ago to me and it struck me quite strong so then i met a guy named matt foy and i talked to him about what i'd seen and he, and he took me around the whole fraser valley and showed me all the different um floodgates that we have and also how a lot of our side channels that we used to travel by canoe on on the fraser um the fraser used to meander you know four or five braids at a time and the outside braids were the smoothest ones and you could you could pull yourself through with canoes and that was our that was our highways in the past but then as you go around you look at it from 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 a different standpoint you realize wow you know the the hope slew is cut off by by a, a, a main Chilliwack dike the number nine highway the cn railway and, and you know all in one cross section cutting off this one channel you know, and right now we're in a position where the water back flows into the into this Hope Slough, and it's you know it's it's really gonna could cause a lot of harm to a lot of people's lives. So that so obviously you know the next solution is to put a floodgate in, and you know right now we're in a time and era where where we do have a say as First Nations people, and we have a you know a governing political say, and sometimes it needs to be a, a legal say, and and so therefore we have some influence on what type of floodgate gets put in there and you know obviously we want to talk about you know keep it now we can find a way to get navigation through there find a way to get salmon through there um and, and keep the flow going right and and so that that's kind of the influence that we're having nowadays uh through through different processes that we in different relationships that we have with uh, the provincial and federal governments um but in the past these things were just built and and you know I think the 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 society has advanced our thought and, and, and consideration to to multiple types of life forces and then that that's a blessing for 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 all of us that live on this land um together and whether you're First Nations or not. Um that that's that's a it's a critical component to the diversity. Um the more life force we have upon our land, the the, the richer we are as a people and that's that's a solo worldview i must say i'm not i'm not sure all you know religions or beliefs feel the same way but that's that's one that we do as as have as stalo people um so just just um beginning of before covid i went and did a presentation to 90 90 grade 3 students and we're over at the um we're at, we're at uh over at the little chilliwack watershed i call it and we're at the top of it first of all and we went to the um, where where the old river used to turn and turn a right before it was cut off and channeled down the Vetter Canal. Um, it used to take a right, go right through Chilliwack through three different three different um, waterways: the Little Chilliwack, Lockacock, and Ashless Creek. But now they're all kind of sloughs. But the very bottom of the of this particular system, they all meet, and that's the traditional name is Quaquat, which means where the waters meet. And right at the very bottom is, is a big is a big uh, floodgate. Well, this floodgate has um, has been a fish killer forever, and you know they're, they're right now the timing of it. What they're trying to do is is to get the fish out, you know, earlier. And um, on the 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 far right of the of the watershed, or far left if you're looking upstream, um, is Skokale First Nation, and they've had a hatchery in there, a, a volunteer hatchery not funded by government 
and they've been producing salmon, um, coho particularly, and, and, and they've been moving into chum because <clears throat> chum have a different timing, so the floodgate wouldn't chew them up. But the coho, when they're doing coho, they, they would get mulched and pumped pumped in pumped out of a, of the system so so this is you can see how one one thing one aspect of our society kind of works against another and this this was going off for like a long time and it was not until um the happy workers had realized that they could have changed their species in order to to kind of fit their worldview around what, what the pump station is doing um so right now you know this particular case there, there's there's people um, talking with the city and, and the engineers um, about replacing this, and and the cost of the replacement of this is phenomenal. Like we're talking like six million dollars or something like that. At now that was like ten years ago. Um, so that 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 is itself is is you know something that's critical. It, the foundation of this pump station is on Squally Reserve, so it's on one of our one of our brother's reserves, and, and that that. So there's going to be some some good discussion, you know, with the city to to make sure that this pump station is is changed. So when it is changed, it's going to change the whole system. Um, so that the so the the work that people like Mike Pearson and uh, Matt Foy and you know the ones that fight for the fish and and the the, the juvenile habitats that exist in there and the the species at risk, you know, all their work doesn't go to go to waste and and that 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 the big infrastructures that we ha that are necessary you know are, are compatible with with um with other values so from that kind of particular standpoint i'm just you know i'm I'm just kind of going off the top of my what i feel i want to share here and kind of maybe laying a little bit of context out for the other presenters and and i hope i my words are, are anything i said is is not offending anybody um you know uh so i i, I go back to you know our our culture right and we have we have a number of different types of principles that we use and you know this is when i was talking about the the, the students i was sharing the story with because i showed them the pump and i showed them the top where where the river has changed but through through my teachings and and my influences in the school districts in the lower fraser valley i'm sharing principles and uh, the principles of like reciprocity um you know when you when you take something give something right uh, don't don't take more than you need and we have a number of principles that we have and children really get this and that that's that's incredible because they're 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 very innocent and they can understand a different value um we're not influenced by by um you know by money and 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 capital as yet right um so i take a lot of time to to share what i experience in my life with with the youth and that's a big component of who i am and what i'd like to do um so at this point maybe i'll just kind of end my my presentation because i realize we have a um i don't know if i heard the dong yet but oh yeah um, i'd like to i okay thank you very much so yeah thank you so much ernie yeah maybe the dong was not quite loud enough but yeah uh, that was really wonderful thank you so much for sharing all your perspectives uh on that uh very very helpful for us to move forward. So thank you so much, Ernie. Uh, so next up, we're gonna have Dave Scott. Uh, Dave Scott is a PhD student in the Pacific Salmon Ecology uh, and Conservation Laboratory at the University of British Columbia under supervision of Dr. Scott Hinch. Um, Dave's research focuses on understanding juvenile uh, Chinook estuary reliance in the Fraser River estuary. He also leads Rain Coast Conservation Foundation's Fraser Estuary Connectivity Project, which has created three large breaches in the Steveston Jetty. Um, and before joining Rain Coast, Dave received a master's from Simon Fraser University studying the effects of flood infrastructure on salmon habitat in the lower Fraser River with Dr. John Moore. And I believe that's going to be the focus of this talk today. So thanks, Dave. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, thanks, Ernie, for uh, your presentation and your words. Uh, definitely sets, uh, sets the stage for uh, where I come in. So uh, thanks for that. And yeah, thanks for everyone attending. Um, so I know we're uh, supposed to be talking about solutions, but I'm really going to be talking to you more about the, the problem. And so 
Um, when I started my master's in 2012, I got introduced to uh, floodgates in the Lower Fraser and I needed a, a master's project. And so I ended up looking at uh, the effect of floodgates and fish uh, in the uh, floodgates, uh, the effect of floodgates on fish in the Lower Fraser. So I'm gonna be talking to you about some research that I did along with uh, a couple of research assistants of mine um, and a master's student named Rebecca Seifer who came after me. Um, and this was all uh, working under John Moore at SFU. And um, this is mostly a presentation that, uh, that he made that I slightly repurposed. So uh, thanks to John for making my life easy. Why isn't it going to the next slide? There we go. Okay, too far. Way too far. Sorry about that. Just give me one second. So, and, and these are the folks I'm talking about here. So, John Moore is uh, in the middle there. Um, that's me and him back in 2013. That's uh, Rebecca in the top corner there. And then uh, my two fantastic field assistants, uh, Michael Arbiter and Jen Gordon. So, that's uh, really the team that did all this work. And so the, this is the problem. So here in the Lower Fraser for flood management, um, because of floods that happened in the past in 19, uh, 1894 and 1948, um, in response to that, there's been a whole system of flood control structures, uh, mostly dikes, so hundreds of kilometers of dikes. And then everywhere that a tributary intersects that dike in the Lower Fraser, you typically have a floodgate controlling the flow. So uh, we have uh, over 150, or sorry, 1,500 um, kilometers of potential salmon habitat, uh, which is disconnected by uh, floodgates and pump stations in the lower Fraser. So a huge amount of uh, salmon habitat uh, locked away uh, behind these structures. And uh, thanks to uh, Watershed Watch for that number. And so what is a flood box? So uh, Nan already showed a, a much better um, diagram than I have here, but essentially it's the same thing that he showed. So we have uh, the river on one side, uh, you have a tributary stream on the other side, and then here in the lower Fraser, you could call it a tide gate, um, but we call them flood boxes. And essentially it's just a culvert with a uh, flap on the downstream side. And then when the river level comes up or the tide comes up, that closes. So um, you already saw Dan's animation uh, and, and I think it, it really shows the problem well. So um, good one on that, Dan. And so this is what it looks like uh, from a top view. So uh, this is a, a slough in the Fraser Valley. You've got the main stem river on one side, uh, you have a dike, um, you have a flood box, and then you have a tributary stream uh, flowing through some farmer's fields on the other side there. So, um, so that's, uh, that's kind of what it looks like. And so we wanted to really start trying to understand how these things were operating. We knew there was a lot of them on the landscape, but uh, they've essentially can, been considered to be benign. Um, essentially, managers thought that you know they open, they close. Once they're open, fish can pass. Not a big deal. So um, this actually came after my study, but we had a master student named Rebecca Seifert who actually went around the Lower Mainland and put cameras on floodgates to see when they would open and for how long. And so uh, what she found was there was a huge variation in the way that these gates were opening operating in the Lower Fraser. So you have some gates. Uh, which open quite a bit. They open every day uh, for about half the day, but then we have a, a significant portion of gates that are really closed the vast majority of the time. So uh, really depending on where these gates are and how they're installed, uh, some of them do open quite a bit and uh, have the potential for fish passage, but some of them are, are staying closed a lot of the time. And when we look at, at where those sites are, we can see that we have this uh, variety based on uh, essentially how tidal the area is. So if we look at the uh, B panel B there, that's the Fraser Valley sites. Essentially what that's showing is just that when the Fraser Freshet comes in and the river level goes up, then essentially uh, those gates are closed. And then when the river level goes back down, the gates are able to open, uh, open and close again with the tide. So um, our, if you look down to the bottom, those are the sites in Delta. So those are the more marine uh, oriented sites. So those are tide gates that actually do open and close uh, with the tide. But you see it was when you move up the river, those uh, floodgates are really controlled by the main stem river level in the Fraser, uh, which can remain high for months uh, at a time during the freshet, which means that those gates are closed. So um, these gates are, are closed for a significant portion of the year 
And of that portion of the year on the far right hand side there, that May and June, uh, that's you know typically when we want to see those juvenile salmon being able to move out, so um, potentially trapping them. So we also wanted to look at water quality, and uh, my two assistants did this as a bit of a spin-off on my masters. And so we looked at sites uh, with and without floodgates, and we looked at the dissolved oxygen concentrations at day and during the night. Uh, and generally what we found is that uh, upstream of the floodgates, we have this uh, hypoxic zone that continues for at least 100 meters. So uh, this is uh, getting into July and August. And um, yeah, what we see is, you know, the, the floodgates are impounding water um, and they're causing the uh, dissolved oxygen concentrations to become uh, very low to uh, a level kind of below safe minimum standards for fish. So. Uh, so we know these gates are, are closed a lot of the time, and now we know that uh, they're creating a, a hypoxic zone uh, for fish. And then we also wanted to look, okay, so what was the effect on native fish communities? And so I had uh, five sites uh, with floodgates and then five reference sites uh, without floodgates. And it was, a, it was a real challenge to five, find five reference sites without floodgates in the lower Fraser, uh, just to give you an idea of the extent of the issue. And so uh, we went out with minnow traps and beach seines and went back to our site sites uh, throughout the summer. Ooh, what happened there? And what we found was uh, that there was a significant decrease in juvenile salmon in the sites with floodgates compared to the reference sites. So uh, this figure is just demonstrating it doesn't have a, a y-axis on there, um, but it's a, it's a log value. But um, you can just uh, trust me that it's a statistically significantly uh, less salmon at sites with floodgates compared to reference sites. And then when we look broadly across the uh, whole native fish community, we saw that it was two and a half times fewer salmon at sites with floodgates compared to reference sites, uh, 14 times lower abundance of other native species like prickly sculpin, uh, peamouth chub, um, red side shiner, so lower abundance of all those other native species. And then we saw an increased abundance of non-native species like pumpkin seeds and like brown bullheads. So um, we've, we've seen this big change in water quality. We know there's this problem with access and it's really borne out in the fish data where we see a huge difference between our reference sites and our sites with floodgates when you look across the fish community. So just to kind of sum that up. So we know that uh, floodgates can be a barrier for adult migration. That's pretty obvious. They don't uh, open that much and you, you, can't, you can imagine it would be very tough for uh, adult salmon to get through a floodgate that's only open a few inches. But we've also found you know, that they're a barrier for juvenile dispersal. We're finding less juvenile salmon uh, at these floodgate sites. We found degraded water quality upstream of these floodgates. So this is potentially creating a, uh, a water quality barrier that fish wouldn't enter that site because the water quality is so poor that uh, they wouldn't be able to access other, other habitats in that area. We see uh, direct harm if they're going through pump stations and getting chewed, chewed up. And then we also are seeing that there's a, a potential for floodgates to facilitate a harmful invasive uh, fish populations by giving them an area where they have a competitive advantage uh, from which they can then branch further out into the rest of the lower Fraser. So uh, we've got some pretty serious uh, uh, impacts from floodgates on our fish communities here. And so just to uh, try to uh, bring it around to potential solutions. So um, one of the things that you can do that Dan already mentioned is get rid of those stupid uh, heavy cast iron uh, top mounted gates. So just moving to a lighter material like an aluminum and putting it on a side mounted orientation just allows it to open a lot more freely. So uh, that's one thing that you can do that's quite simple that you can just go in, modify the gates without to actually modify the whole system. Another option is to just chain the gates open when the flood risk is low and we've seen that uh, they do this at some of the local waterways um, and it's quite effective and, and you know the one of the big issues with floodgates is that they're they're there on the landscape 365 days a year causing impacts whereas their their utility is only for a small portion of the year when flood risk is high so uh, you know if we can just chain these things open when we don't need them that's a really simple step. There's also this idea that we have we could use these self-regulating gates. So that's the picture in the bottom right um, that have an actuator that allows water to move into the system until they close at a certain high water level. Um, but from uh, reports from Mike Pearson and others, there's some serious uh, 
concerns with the actual effectiveness of these structures. So uh, they don't close until near the high tide, but um, that's actually when juvenile salmon want to move into those areas. So um, they might not kind of be the uh, panacea that uh, we're hoping for. There's also uh, the option to just create setback dikes on the lower elevation uh, tidal freshwater creeks. So here in the Fraser Valley, we have this very low elevation um, floodplain, but then these a lot of these tributaries, they'll run for about a kilometer until they hit the mountainside and the elevation picks up. So instead of putting a floodgate at the mouth, you can just put dikes along the uh, lower portions of that tributary until there's some elevation that gets rid of the flood risk. Could also just uh, allow some seasonal flooding in low value agricultural areas. Uh, one of our sites, Nathan Creek, on one side they have a dike and on the other side they don't. And on the other side it just floods part of the farmer's field in the spring and uh, he seems to be alright with that. So that's an option as well. And then lastly, uh, we need better solutions. So uh, these are these are all okay, but they're not great. And I'm not an engineer, so I, I can't really uh, invent something. But uh, you know, I was thinking about something to get rid of that problem of, of juvenile salmon moving at high tide. So maybe you have some kind of system that's actually the opposite, where the gate's closed at a lower tide, and then once it hits a certain level, the water can spill over or some kind of a mechanism that allows fish to go over instead of uh, instead of through. So that's I'm just going to throw that out there, and uh, and yeah, I'm happy to uh, if people want to send me any questions or anything like that. Uh, yeah, let me know. All right, thanks so much, Dave. Great presentation and great uh, setup for kind of the issues we're dealing with here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um. I just want to check if, if if people are hearing the gongs or if they are getting canceled out by the. I didn't hear anything. Okay, shoot. All right, I need a new system. <laughs> you, you were still in very good time. I think you're at about ten minutes thirty. So I need a new system. I'll figure that out while our next presenter is going. <laughs> uh, and our next presenter is. John Boland. There we go. Thanks, John. So John is a, um, let me just give you a quick intro, John. John is a researcher at the University of Hull International Fisheries Institute in England. He specializes in the spatial ecology of freshwater and diadromous fishes in a range of aquatic environments, including the influence of water pumping station operation, hydropower schemes, reservoir compensation, flow releases, <coughs> fish passage solutions. That's a mouthful you gave me, John. <laughs> John also manages a collaborative research project with the environment agency called REDEEM. I really like this acronym. Research and Development of Fish and Eel Entrainment Mitigation at Pumping Stations. So thank you, John, for presenting today. Uh, excited to hear what you have to say. Hi there. Thanks, Dan. Hopefully everyone can hear me and see my screen. Um, I'm just going to crack on on that assumption. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invite for being here today. Oh, John, I'm, I'm going to wave my arms if when you hit seven minutes. That'll be the first and then I'll wave my arms again. Yeah. Okay. Got you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to try and give a brief overview of where we're at in England over here and a little bit of an um, overview of the project that Dan's just mentioned there. Um, so I'm just going to go straight in and just say that the Pure emphasis really at the minute on pumping stations over here in England is all about European eels um, with a kind of real strong focus on the downstream migration of the adults. Um, it's pretty easy for the little guys to get in the systems, but it's really hard for the big old girls to get out on their way downstream to the Sargasso Sea. So for those um, on the webinar that don't know about the life cycle of the European eel. They spawn over in the Sargasso Sea, migrate up to Europe on the Gulf Stream, and then head inland and live in our freshwater systems for 10, 20, 30 years, and then try and leave to go back to the Sargasso. Um, and yeah, they're having a real hard time right now. They're critically endangered. Um, since 1980, the stocks have just plummeted, less than 5% of where they were. Um, loads and loads and loads of reasons for their decline and pumping stations and barriers to migration are just one of them and then our cluster is critically endangered and we've got specific legislation that requires us to protect them from 
human mediated activities. And yeah, one of those is pumping stations. Uh, there's a little map of little old England and we've got quite a few of them, these structures, uh, over 900 around the country. Um, and yeah, there's European legislation that basically says that any, any structure that abstracts more than 20 meters cubed of water a day needs to have some kind of eel protection measure on it. And at the minute, there's a kind of real strong dive for that to be screening to just prevent fish and eels going through pumps and uh, being injured and potentially killed. Um, and we're involved in some research trying to understand that problem. So hopefully for most people on this webinar, you, you kind of get this, but this is my very quick animation of what a pumping station is. And basically the downstream river level is higher um, than the upstream river level because we've messed our rivers pretty hard over here and we need pumps to get the water out. Uh, and that's what it looks like. You get end of river, there's a screen, a trash rack, whatever you guys call it, wherever you are in the world. And basically 100% of the water goes through that screen, that pump and out to sea. Um, that's not great if you're a fish, to be honest. And as has just been kind of talked about a little bit, when the pump pumps aren't running, this isn't a river anymore. It's just a big, long lake. And you can see these are very heavily modified systems, almost completely man-made, no repairing habitat. Um, but generally speaking, it's sub aqua, it's pretty good habitat if you're an eel. So we started an investigation maybe five or so years ago now, trying to understand the extent of pumping station influence on eel migration. So we looked at the migration through the catchment and what happens when eels arrive at the structure. Do they mill around? Do they retreat? Do they just go straight through? What happens when they go through the pumps themselves? And then are they able to complete their own migration? And um, we wrote a little paper on that a little while ago, fairly um, high level, simple summary of some of these things. And we found that, yeah, eels, other fish do die when they go through pumps, but there are lots of other things going on here that we need to try and understand around their migration and what happens when they arrive at the structure. And this basically led to where we are right now with this overly complicated acronym that we spend the majority of our time trying to think of. Um, and yeah, redeem. And we're just trying to understand the fish and eel distribution and behavior of these pump catchments. And then trying to assess the effectiveness of some of the solutions that are out there, trying to almost invent some of the solutions ourselves, apply some innovative measures, um, and try and, apply to, try and identify some real applied outcomes that um, people that own these structures can use in the real world because their primary jobs is to move water and they don't know a whole lot about moving fish or preventing fish kills. So um, this is where we are right now. We've got a whole heap of students, postgrads, postdocs, all working on this. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through every project. I'm not going to go through every name, but these are some of the ones that I'm going to focus on right now to just emphasize how we're trying to uh, understand this issue and help solve the issue. So we're assessing the distribution of fish and eels in pump catchments, um, trying to provide safe downstream passage routes, um, whether fish friendly pumps are the answer, and then also looking at things that aren't eels as well. Um, so yeah, this is one of the, oops, excuse me. So single slide overview of the whole PhD, here we go. But basically do fish and eels live upstream of pumping stations. As I've just discussed, they've got complete barriers to migration in an upstream direction and a downstream direction. As was talked about in the last talk, it probably impacts on the water quality. They're heavily managed water bodies with you know, very little fishy habitat at times. And we're just trying to understand what lives there. Uh, at the minute, all pumping stations in the country need to apply, comply with eel regs, um, but we don't even know if eels live in those systems. And generally speaking, because they're side channels to the main river, they've historically not been sampled. So we think approximately two thirds of the pump catchments in the UK have never had a fish there. We just don't know what lives there. It's no mean feat trying to understand the distribution of fish in over 900 pumping stations. So uh, certainly using traditional techniques, we're looking at whether we can use environmental DNA as a quicker and simpler route to assessing the fish distribution upstream of these structures to understand where fish or eels need to be protected. And this is Nathan Griffiths right there taking a water sample and this is just a very simple output that just shows that 10, 10 pumping stations on one of our relatively local rivers it's got a, generally speaking it's a pretty impo impoverished fish population it's basically 
sticklebacks and then occasionally some pike or maybe a roach if um, they're unlucky, unlucky enough to be up there. So then moving on, so can we provide safe downstream passage, especially at sites where there's a potential sluice or a safe route that isn't a pumped route out of the system? So here's one of our study sites. It was built way back in the 1950s. Um, many pumps, but then there's a sluice there. Water can be let out through there. Tidal downstream, we're trying to understand. Um, we've been working at this site for about five years. It was actually in that paper that I just mentioned. Um, and so now we're trying to modify the operating regimes so instead of them just about moving water we're trying to focus the operating regimes on moving eels during the times of their migration generally speaking we look it looks like that's an option but it's certainly not um the perfect solution but it's better than nothing right now and then also fish friendly pumps so this is a brand new fish friendly pumping station that's been built we're trying to understand whether fish and or certainly eels are prepared to swim through it and you can see here there's this Kind of Manhattan skyline type plot, bar plot, just the number of eels as a relative proportion that approach a screen, and then those that are prepared to go through the screen, and then those that are actually prepared to go through the pump. So, this kind of gap here is those that go through the screen and then retreat back up upstream. So, we're spending a lot of time looking at not just whether the fish friendly pumping stations are fish friendly, just whether fish are prepared to swim through them. And then, as well, just not forgetting about the other fish that live in the rivers in this area. So, we have a fairly um, some of the systems have heavy coarse fish communities. You can see here I did some screenshot of a shoal of roach with a pike swimming through it. But basically, fish go and live inside these structures when the pumps aren't in operation. So during the day, there's thousands and thousands of fish live inside these structures, and we're trying to think and find ways of um, preventing them getting killed when they turn on. So yeah, that's me. That's a review of where we're at and what research we're performing right now. Just thanks to everyone for listening, and thanks to everyone that's been involved in the research and helped fund it so far. You're still on mute, Dan. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks, definitely, John. Uh, yeah, that was great. Um, I was really surprised to learn that basically salmon and eels basically have an opposite life history almost. So that's, uh, yeah. that's very interesting to think about the difference of the challenges. Um, we're gonna move on to Paul Franklin, who has very kindly joined us from uh, New Zealand. Um, so he, you can imagine what time it might be in New Zealand right now. He has kindly volunteered to wake up at about four o'clock in the morning, I think. So Paul is a freshwater fish ecologist and program lead at the National Institute of Water and Atmos Atmospheric Research. Paul has spent the last 10 years getting to know New Zealand's unique fish fauna and the challenges they face, and he also leads New Zealand's fish passage research and has been working closely with stakeholders to develop national guidance on fish passage management and assessment of fish passage barriers. Thanks, Paul. Oh, and I'll just unmute you. There we go. There we go. Right. Can you see my presentation there? Yep. Great. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say um, thanks very much to Dan for inviting me along and giving me such an early start to the day um, on a Saturday morning, I should add, as it is here. Um, but it's um, it's been really interesting listening to those first couple of presentations. Actually, I might as well just do the first two slides of mine which talk about the kind of fish in New Zealand and then leave the rest because it's the same. Um, so just to give a quick setting for where we are, for those who don't know, we're right down here, just um, off Australia. So this is what New Zealand looks like. This is where I work. This is where the hobbits live, just about 10 minutes up the road from where I currently am. This is about where Mount Doom is. And these are the kind of rivers that everyone thinks we work on in New Zealand. And this is the kind of river that I seem to have end up spending most of my time working on somehow. So that's a bit of a context. Um, and I think another important thing for me to emphasize is we actually have really unique fish fauna here in New Zealand. Um, but what we'll realize is the problems around flood pumps and tide gates aren't unique. 
So we, had, we have around 53 native species here, but nearly 90% of them are endemic. And so only exist in New Zealand. Um, but we're not doing a particularly good job of looking after them. And like I say, they're three quarters there actually classified as threatened or at risk. Um, most of our widespread species are diadromous and migrate between the sea and freshwater. Uh, John likes to think he's got some good eels, but this is a prop picture of a real eel um, held by my colleague Don Jellyman there. That's one of our longfin eels. So they can grow up to nearly two metres long and sort of 15 to 20 kilos. Um, and then we've got a range of other smaller fish. Now, um, Dan just mentioned about the complete opposite between the life cycle of eels versus salmon. Well, our most common form of migration is actually amphidromy, which is another um, kind of life cycle. So here, a lot of our species will spawn in fresh water, but as the eggs hatch, the larvae go straight to sea on hatching and then rear in the ocean for sort of four months, three to four months. And then they migrate back into fresh water as really small bodied juveniles. So we're talking 40, 50, 60 millimeters long. So um, for our guys, even a drop of about 10 centimeters is enough to almost completely block their movements. Unlike your nice salmon that can, you know, jump a meter on their way in. So we, it presents us with a few different um, challenges. So, um, so as uh, Scott mentioned, with tide gates, the key issues that we're observing is they're often the first barrier that a lot of our migratory fish encounter as they move upstream. And then there's two impacts. There's that physical barrier effect, the gates closed, you can't get through but also we've done some work around looking at the habitat degradation. So obviously when you put a gate in, it completely alters the hydrology and impacts on the water quality. So this is just a quick summary of uh, a small study we did on one of the tight gated streams near here. Um, we actually ran a test where we artificially held one of these gates open to see what the impact actually was. Um, this little figure down here, the site one was downstream. And what you can see here is the gray lines indicate the range in the water level over time. And this blue dotted line shows when we started the trial of opening the gate. And you can see all the sites upstream had basically no variation before you open the gate. And when you open the gate, funnily enough, it reintroduces that variation. You need to suddenly get a lot more flushing of water through the system and it returns it to that more natural dynamic um, habitat. But sort of associated with that effect, it disrupts the salinity transition. So particularly a lot of these gates sort of sit in that sort of tidal, partially saline zone. And that's a really important sort of zone for where fish adjust their metabolism and physiology as they come from the marine salty water into the fresh water. And it creates this just abrupt change when you introduce these gates. Uh, we also found the same with Scott, really low dissolved oxygen, literally down at zero milligrams per litre um, for hours on end. Um, and when we actually opened this gate, we found that um, was recovered really quickly. We had the same with high water temperatures. And again, when you reintroduce that variation in the flows, the temperatures drop down as well. The other thing, when you sort of have those tide gated systems, it creates a real depositional zone upstream of the gates as well. So we get a lot of deposited fine sediment and all of these things favor exotic species over the natives. So that includes both sort of exotic mac fights, which sort of proliferate in those areas and fill them up, um, and also the exotic fish species that we don't actually want there. So the other, one of the problems we've actually found with the having discussions with tide gate owners 
around this is that often you get a little bit of passage part of them. So people go, well, we can see some fish upstream, so we're obviously not causing a problem. Um, but there was certainly one study here using a Didson sort of underwater acoustic camera, and you can see the massive aggregations of fish downstream of the gates. So it's pretty clear that they are blocking the movements of fish. Um, recently, there has been some attempts to install these, what people like to call fish friendly um, tide gates. I'm not sure that's the best name in the world for them, but uh, Scott sort of alluded to them where the idea is that they have a sort of counterweight system that supposedly delays the closing of the gate. Now, these um, graphs here just show a few examples. Now, this there was a master's thesis that was done a few years back looking at these. And in the examples they looked at, they found there was a lot of variation in how these gates worked. But in that case, they found that on average, it increased the opening time of around an hour. Um, but in some cases, it increased it significantly. Uh, more recently, we were involved in a study looking at one, and that's this graph at the bottom. And we actually found that they just didn't work at this site. And that's the one in this picture. Um, even when they wax loads of extra weight onto the gate, it opens the gate slightly wider. But the actual duration of opening was increased by about five minutes. So it's effectively useless. And we've actually, since then, discovered that there are more sites where people have been doing some monitoring of these gates and have found exactly the same. And so there's a real issue around these being installed, but no one's actually done any proper testing. And I think the guy who's manufacturing and installing these particular ones actually doesn't have a clue what the effective operating range is. Um, and I think they get sold because people feel good for having put in their fish friendly gate even though it's made no difference or they don't know if it's made any difference so it's what i like to call feel good fixes so finally i should have given the warning before i put this one up um pumping stations there's been very limited work in new zealand so far um it's been something that's happened recently and much like john the main focus is the downstream migration of eels actually through these. Um, I think most of the structure owners have been living in denial for the last however many decades, um, but it's becoming a more prominent issue that people are being told to look at. And in particular, because eels have really high indigenous value in New Zealand. Um, just recently, there was this uh, study done at this pumping station here um, this was the first time anyone had looked at mortality at these pumps in New Zealand and they found more than 90% mortality of eels moving through these and you can see from these pictures that you know they get minced up even if they aren't chopped up to pieces their insides are totally uh, messed up or they also found that some of them looked fairly good on the outside but they've got you know, fractured spines and completely missing skulls and crushed skulls and so on. So it's not pretty, uh, but these pictures do make people take notice, um, which is quite helpful. Uh, they have recently replaced that pumping station with one of those fish friendly pump designs and Archimedes screw, and they found that they've reduced the mortality to only about 20% which is obviously much better than 90%, but still isn't particularly fish friendly if you're still killing 20% of your fish. Um, and the other thing we've seen upstream of these pump stations is really poor water quality again. So again, dissolved oxygen at zero for days on end. So just coming up to final slide, um, where to next for us? Um, we recently published a national fish guidance document but I can tell you there is next to nothing in there about tide gates and pump stations because there was basically no evidence to base any recommendations on other than don't use them. Um, 
And there's also recent national policy has been literally in the last couple of weeks announced putting in more protection and it actually bans passive uh, tide gates being installed effectively. So it's going to make it much more difficult for those kind of things to be put in. Um, but as a country, we really don't have a great idea of how big this problem is. Um, we're currently doing some more work around the flood pumping stations, particularly where they have um, like the bypass channel, like John was talking about with the sluices. Um, and also we've just got a recruited a master student who's going to be looking at some of those fish friendly gates to try and understand where and when they are actually working versus not. So as I said at the start, um, different fish, basically the same problems. So thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. Yeah, it's a really interesting, same kinds of challenges and different kinds of challenges, for sure. And I like the terminology of the feel good fixes. Um, I'm gonna catch us up. So now we've got two presenters left. Uh, I know that we are running a tiny bit behind schedule, but uh, I think it, it's gonna work out all right. And um, what I'm gonna say is, I think I'd like to have Ben and Carrie still present and then we'll have a little break and then go into questions and answers. Um, and also don't forget to uh, head to slido.com if you want, if you have questions that are burning in your mind already um, and put them in there. Uh, you can enter the code salmon again, or I will copy and paste the event code again in, in the chat. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Ben. Uh, and so Ben is a researcher at, I'm not gonna pronounce this correctly, he's already corrected me once today, Wageningen, that's my best attempt, University and uh, the Marine Research Center there. Uh, ben specializes in fish behavior, fish migration, and is involved in multiple studies, mostly on eel migration and highly regulated water systems and rivers. Uh, he was involved in the fish migration river design and pre-monitoring. Uh, the Fish Migration River is a large four kilometer fish passage that will connect the nature reserve areas of the Wadden Sea and Lake Ijsel to stimulate the migration of different target species. Uh, looking forward to hear about this, Ben. Thanks. Yes, thank you for having me. Is it working? Yeah. We're all good, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the next coming minutes, I will try to uh, present something about fish migration, evaluation, studies and solutions in the Netherlands. Um, so this is a map of the Netherlands. Um, in the Netherlands, we have a lot of barriers. All the blue and purple dots are some sort of barriers for, for in the water systems. And that causes a, a lot, uh, a large problem for fish migration, of course, and you can imagine. Also, uh, quite a large part of the Netherlands uh, lays uh, below a seawater level. So we have to protect ourselves for uh, uh, yeah, flooding. And uh, that's also gives some problems for fish migration, of course. So <clears throat> I will start my presentation about uh, a study uh, which we just finished. Um, that's a study uh, in the middle of the Netherlands, over here, the, in the west of the Netherlands. And uh, that's a large canal. And just to give an idea how we uh, try to uh, evaluate fish migration and fish migration solutions uh, along a canal. It's a brackish canal of 30 kilometer, kilometers. And there are a lot of pumping stations along the canal. And uh, we try to evaluate if fish can reach the canal and if so, if they can reach the hinterland uh, uh, you know, after the, the pumping stations. So we tag fish and to see, we follow them along the canal and uh, to see whether they can pass the pumping stations. And what we see, well, this is a difficult picture, I won't go into detail and go straight to the conclusions. Uh, what we see uh, in these uh, studies is that large and consistent flows of uh, pumping stations attract a lot of fish also glass you and um, yeah, those uh, constant attraction flow in the canal caused prolonged accumulations of glass eels and other fish 
especially at sites uh, where no migration solutions uh, are uh, um, able are present over there. And that's not we so don't see that along um, uh, only at the canal, but also along the coast of the Netherlands. For example, over here and uh, the top in the north of the Netherlands, there is a large dike. It's uh, 30 kilometers long. And this used to be a, a marine uh, area, uh, but in the beginning of 1900s, they built this dike, and now it's a complete large freshwater lake. Uh, so fish that want to reach uh, rivers here in the Netherlands, in, in Holland, uh, they have to pass this dike. And they only can pass it by uh, pass this. Uh, so this is the dike. Um, and these are, uh, yeah, we call them spilling gates, but I don't know if it's the, the right, correct uh, English uh, word. But And uh, the problem with this uh, spilling gates is that the water uh, flow direction is always towards the sea. So there's no opportunity for fish to go with the flow towards the freshwater lake. So that's a real problem, especially for the smaller fish. So a few years ago, they asked us to help uh, and to design a fish pass which um, is fish friendly, is uh, helping fish that are really small to go with the flow, go with the currents, go with the tidal currents towards the freshwater lake. So this is an artificial impression. It's not there yet. Uh, in the next coming years, that they, they will want, they uh, will be building this. If you want to see a, a impression, go to YouTube and type in "fish migration river offslide dike" and you can find a really nice impression. So <clears throat> we had a lot of target species uh, for the fish pass design of this, um, but especially the the. The smaller fish like the flounder larvae and the glass eels were uh, main target species, but also stickleback, smelt, lampreys, and of course also the larger uh, strong swimmers uh, uh, also want or have to use these uh, fish paws. So when we started to design this uh, fish paws, uh, we asked ourselves so uh, if we want to have this uh, pass which is really large. Uh, it should be work. It must be working because it's a lot. Of, it's it's expensive, and um, so we ask ourselves where the entrance should be. Uh, it should. Um, we we wanted to know something about the searching behavior of fish. If there were hot spots in the the basin, um, and if so, then we have to have the entrance over there. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Uh, also, we wanted to know if the fish need some time to get used to the fresh water. Uh, if they are coming from the sea and there's a hard border between salt water and fresh water, do we need time to, to get used to the fresh water? Also, something about water velocities. At the current state, there is uh, a water velocity of uh, four or five meters per second, and especially for the smaller fish, that's really high water velocity and they can't uh, cope with that. Um, so we did several studies, and I will go into detail about two of them. Uh, first, about the sea lamprey. Uh, we tagged 25 sea lampreys uh, with uh, FEMCO transmitters. Uh, we installed uh, receivers to uh, all of in the in the system. So this is the dike. This is the water sea, salt water. This is the freshwater lake. And uh, we released 25 lampreys over here to see what they were doing in this area and if they are able to reach the freshwater lake without uh, having this large fish pass. So. What we saw is that of the 25 fish, only four of them reached the freshwater lake. Um, and uh, what you see here is uh, one till 10. There are 10 gates over here, one till 10. And if it's dark gray, then it's fully closed. Uh, light gray is partially open. If it's light, light like gray, it's, uh, it's open. And it's, if it's black, then it, it's uh, past the, the gates. And this is time. And what you see is that three of the four fish uh, passed the gates at the end of a discharge event. So that was when the gates were open. And one of them uh, passed it when uh, at the beginning of a discharge event, but none of them were in the middle. And that's because then at that time, the water velocities are really, really high and they are not coping with the water velocities. So conclusions about the lampreys. Um, yeah. 
part of them, 16 to 28 percent of the lampreys are successfully uh, able to pass the the, the dike. Uh, they use different migration windows, uh, but and that was a, a good conclusion. Uh, we are happy about to see that they showed a lot of activity. And um, if we want to have an entrance of this large fish pass, then um, it doesn't really matter where the entrance is, uh, is uh, as long as it's in the as it is in the basin, because they show a lot of activity, and in the end, they will find the entrance of uh, of the fish pass. So a second study we did on uh, the smaller fish. What we did is um, we did a study on uh, glass eel, flounder larvae, uh, stickleback, and uh, smelt. We used large lift nets, and we wanted to see whether this, are, this is the, sp the spilling basin or the basin. Um, and uh, we wanted to know where, whether there are hot spots in this basin. And if so, then that should be a really good location for the entrance of this fish pass. Um, so I will go straight to the conclusions. Um, we didn't found significant hotspots, um, but we found relatively more fish in the southwest of the basin. So this could be a really good uh, location for the entrance because we want to um, yeah, um, have this design uh, as good as um, meet the, the behavior of the fish. Um, but we also saw that uh, the, the, the catches of the fish during the tidal cycle increased. So this is, uh, for example, with stickleback, at low tide you catch uh, not that many stickleback, at rising tide you catch more, and high tide you get a lot of them. And also for glassy, that's the same. So they use the tidal currents for, uh, in this spill, uh, in this basin. So selected tidal transport was present, and therefore tidal currents help fish to reach freshwater lake. So um, then with these conclusions, we go, went to design the, the fish pass. And so we concluded that with all the other studies we've done, uh, that the fish pass should be open 24 seven a day, year round, uh, open as much as possible, but also allow tidal currents um, uh, as far as possible in the in the, the the fish pass. This is four kilometers long. Over here, this is the dike, and you can see there is an opening in the dike, and um, there's also a, a vertical slot over here, but also some safety uh, gates. Uh, so if there is a really high tide or spring tide, then the gates will be closed over here. But still, there is a vertical slot, so fish can reach uh, all uh, all the time over here. Uh, they can pass it and they have to swim four kilometers over here and here the, the, the tide of the, the rising tide can reach up to half of the river over here and sometimes even over here at the end of the river, artificial river, uh, but the, the final part they have to swim uh, actively towards the freshwater lakes because there's no salt water allowed in the freshwater lakes. So that's a limitation of the design. Um, also, the attraction flow is really important over here. This is the basin. Uh, fish will reach the basin and then they have to find the entrance of this fish bar. So we came up with a solution that we wanted to have two entrances. So in the future, uh, if one of the two entrances is uh, really good, uh, then we can close off the one of them uh, or we can open both of them uh, depending on the, the, the season, for example. Um, so the design is really what well, is flexible over here, but also over here, um, because this is the final stage of the, the fish pass. And um, if the salt water is reaching this level, uh, still there are some openings in the doors uh, to uh, for fish to be able to reach the freshwater lake. And those are openings in the doors um, on different water levels, di different depth, um, so that they can, uh, with the tide, with the current, reach the freshwater lake. So in the next, uh, this year, they started to build this uh, huge project. And hopefully in two, three years, it will be finished. 
we're really curious uh, how good it works. It will work for some part. It will help fish to reach uh, the freshwater lake. But how good it works, that's still uh, the, the big question uh, at this, uh, this side. So that's uh, what I wanted to, to share with you all. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ben. Yeah, that's such a, um, a big scale. I don't think uh, we quite have that in our context. So it's uh, really interesting to see. And I think particularly kind of uh, around how you're thinking of water velocity um, as well. Uh, okay, and our last presenter, I'm seeing now there are questions flowing in on Slido, so that's great. Thanks very much. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Carrie Barron now. And so Carrie is a drainage manager at City of Surrey uh, and a professional engineer with over 30 years of experience in municipal water resources and environmental engineering. Uh, and her responsibilities include overseeing the function of natural and man-made drainage systems, floodplain and dike management, climate change adaptation, and sea level rise planning and sea level rise planning initiatives. She is also involved in the city's community climate action plan and adaptation strategy, uh, coastal flood adaptation strategy, and Fraser Basin Council's lower mainland flood management strategy. She is a busy human and is doing a lot, as you can tell. <laughs> so over to you, Carrie. Uh, hi there. So a little bit of a different twist because I'm not a biologist, I'm an engineer and um, trying to make old systems better for fish. May not be perfect, but they can't get any worse. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of how Surrey has been transitioning some of our pump stations from traditional impeller types to more fish friendly types and some of the issues we've come across and some of the things we're trying to do. Um, just to give you context, uh, a lot of Surrey is within floodplain. Uh, we have a lot of shorelines. Uh, we have the Fraser River, Serpentine, Nickel, Mickle, Campbell, Boundary Bay. Uh, we have about 100 kilometers of dikes, 28 pump stations, two sea dam structures, uh, which are over 110 years old, 170 flood boxes, 10 spillways. So we got massive amount of these, let's call them barriers, as everybody else has called them in the presentations. But in our existing pump stations, what happened is we have 28 drainage pump stations at this time. In the early or late 1990s, we developed our lowland um, flood strategy, which was to help bring ARTSA criteria, which is a, a recognized farming criteria to our farmers in the lowlands, who are complaining at the time they were flooding more. When we were bringing this criteria in of upgrading our dikes and pump stations, we looked at which creeks were, had fisheries values or potential for fisheries values. So as we were planning our new pump stations, we, we started bringing on the fish pump stations. So we have traditional impeller pumps. Those are the ones that people were talking about a lot. Um, uh, they're the ones that grind the fish up more. We have 12 of those in operation right now. Archimedes screws, uh, those were the fish friendly ones shown in the New Zealand example. We have 10 of those going right now. Hydrostall pumps have a bigger vein. They've been used in fish farms for a lot of times to uh, move fish between pens. We just have bigger ones. And then the newest kind we've brought in are our low level Bedford pumps. We have three of those installations as well. And this just kind of gives you an idea. Remember, you can't change all your pump stations overnight because they do cost a lot of money and you should be strategic with this. Why do we need the drainage pump stations? Flooding. Uh, long and short of it, it comes down to flooding. A lot of Surrey, um, our lowlands area was diked in the late 1800s. And so we've inherited a system of dikes for farming activities and reclaimed land, kind of like the Netherlands that is below sea level uh, for a large part of Surrey since the 1800s. And we, and then there's other urban areas that do flood too without dikes, flood pump stations, etc. But we do have active spawning. We actually have a, a good uh, spawning population that migrates even through some of these barriers, but how can we make it better? So with the Archimedes screw pump, just to give you guys an idea, like more engineers kind of know what these things look like, but this is what you're going to see what they look like. If you've ever been to Disneyland or SeaWorld, they actually use the same pumps for some of their rides that you can see. So I always say that we could always change our focus here if we ever need to be a ride. Um, but 
you'll see them, each one of these shafts here is, has a giant screw in it, and the fish can ride up the screw. They're not as efficient from an engineering point of view to pump, um, they take more energy, etc. but they don't, you can see with the giant veins, the fish don't get caught on them, they can actually ride up these uh, pumps. And a lot of times we'll have them in series. What our uh, maintenance people found out that we were designing our pump stations each uniquely for, uh, oh, this one needs two CMS, this one needs one CMS capacity. And so we were designing each unique and then our, our operation staff who have to maintenance go, well, gee, it's hard to have backup parts for all these different sizes. So we started putting these into series of the same size, same length, so that we could interchange them or fix them quite easy. The other thing we tried at one pump station was we put a fish ladder in. So you can see the ladder right now because the river is down. So uh, fish can come through, you can see a side mounted uh, gate here. Fish, that's the open passage when the river is down. Uh, but at times of high river, we have a pump come on that can actually pump water into this fish ladder. So the fish can come from the river over and they actually is a slide on the far side. So once they come up the ladder, they just slide down into the channel behind. But remember, water is going to be higher when this is all going on, but just gives you an idea at low water so you can actually see how it kind of looks in these things. Um, we switched over in about, well, about five years ago, we switched over five or six to using a hydro stall pump. This came as our pump station along the Fraser River. We had a very confined area that we had to, um, our old pump station was not flood proof. So if the Fraser came up too high, our flood station would actually flood, which is not the most ideal thing you want to have. So we actually reconstructed the whole thing with a different kind of fish family pumps. These ones have the bigger impeller blades. Again, so fish can't get clogged because the blades aren't as tight. And um, these are the ones that have been used at fish farms for many years. It's just now um, we have bigger installations. And the reason we couldn't go to the Archimedes screw pumps was just the way every area transitioned with an active railway that we were trying to cross that was right adjacent to the dike. We did not have room or means to install with enough depth the discharge pipes from a screw pump operation. And with, we we're also building it between two bridge structures. So this is uh, Patello Bridge right here for those who in the lower mainland. And this is the CN trestle beside it. And so this is squished in our channel behind it. Fraser River is on this side uh, to the top of your screen. And this is Patello Canal. We do have an active fish spawning run through here. It is not, um, nobody augments it with any hatchery fish. It's just a wild run. And it's goes through the worst industrial area you can believe, but every year we get thousands of fish in the system. But it just kind of gives you an idea of, it's not an easy thing sometimes to squish these into historic areas, but so you have to be inventive and look at all the technologies available. These are a couple more of the hydrosol installations. So what we also tried to do with these after we built the first one, was try to have similar pump sizes and the similar equipment again, so that if we have problems in one place, we have backup parts we can choose from another place or we can buy a backup that sits on the shelf till we need it uh, for our maintenance people. So Maple is down at Crescent Beach. Um, this little building here was the old pump station. This is our new one with the four bays um, and better gates, et cetera, passage, all in that. Um, and this is over at Harvest. This is over off the of 64th Avenue in Surrey. What we've been finding uh, since we started putting our Archimedes screw pumps in in the late 90s is in our lowlands area, we have a lot of subsidence. Not just um, subsidence is when the ground just sinks. A lot of our soil is compressible peat. And so we've been having a, a variation of subsidence. It can be as much as two, well, as low as two centimeters per year versus higher. So um, depending where you are, depends what it is. Now with an Archimedes screw pump, that screw shaft cannot be changed. That is your limiting factor. So as the land was subsiding and the ditch is going lower, our shaft could not go down as deep to get the water down as far as we needed it. 
we're still talking about the same amount of uh, freeboard for the fish. We're not draining our, our creeks at all or our ditches, but we couldn't get low enough for the farmers' uh, field drains to drain anymore because their land had sunk so much. So what we did was we put in these low level systems on, these were existing pump stations, but we also have a future design of when we get rid of the main pump station, how that can be made fish friendly too. So even though these low ones went in, we have a future design of how we would bring this to fish friendly in the future for the whole, um, all the pumps in the place. And also how we would adapt this, not only for subsidence, but for sea level rise. Um, one of the big things we found is sea level rise here is gonna affect us one plus meters in this area by 2100. Our pump stations, when you build a building, they typically last about 100 years. The pumps themselves last about 40. How could we adapt over time our pump stations and everything? So that's why you see the, this building being so weirdly high on stilts is because that's our electrical controls. We won't have to rebuild that building come the future uh, until that building fails at the end of its life. So it's not just designing for one factor, we're designing for multiple. Um, things when we do our pump stations. One of the big things to consider when we're selecting our pumps, again, uh, fish family can be substantially more expensive depending on what you're doing. And make sure you're putting them in areas that you know there's fish, the fish are there or you have high potential for the fish. There's a few areas that may just go a few meters on the other side to, to Joe's little ditch beside his house. It's not a fish ditch. It doesn't go to upland, it doesn't go to spawning. You don't need to necessarily put highly expensive systems in for that. So be critical when you're doing it. Um, you look at what the needs and your property needs are. If you have lots of land, and like, like our guys really love the, the Archimedes screw pumps, and they said they're way easier to maintain. Maintenance costs are way lower. Uh, they are, they think, well, we think they're better for the fish, etc. So we put them in when we can, uh, but you also have to have your property needs if they're showing you on a tele system. There was no way we could fit it into that. So what was our alternative? Seismic needs. One of the big things here in the lower mainland um, is earthquakes. Pump stations will take you about two years to rebuild. And remember, after an earthquake, you probably have some dikes failing, et cetera. Your pump stations are your lifeline to recovery. So we actually put extra money into these two to make them seismically uh, stable so that they will not fail in a seismic event. I can fix a dike pretty fast, I can't fix a pump station very fast. My pump station's needed to get the water out after a big flood or after a seismic event. We also have the backup generators or we have channels going between stations where one station will have a generator so we can use that as our backup. Uh, maintenance and parts. Uh, you, no pump station just has one pump, so you always have double pumps so that if one, uh, goes then you have a backup on the other so just to have that and look at end of life condition subsidence rainfall all those kind of things and then consider your maintenance issues one of the things on the fish pumps is uh, our hydrosol in bedford we can only get parts from europe uh, ontario for the screw pumps but all the parts come from europe um, so it is a little more challenging than traditional ones that are out here and then that's about it so kind of putting more of the engineering aspect when you're looking at these as well. Thanks so much, Carrie. It's, uh, it's super valuable to have that perspective because, um, yeah, we can see the problems, but then uh, we have to, to do what, uh, what we can in the moment when we're working on these solutions. So having your uh, wisdom and having used all of these solutions is probably quite unique, um, at least for the lower mainland, I'm sure. Uh, so with that, I, I see that we're at 1140. I planned a very aggressive schedule. Um, I really want to thank our presenters for like uh, for giving us some great presentations and lots to think about. Um, I'm going to waive our five minute break. I hope that's okay for everyone uh, because we only have 20 minutes left together now. So this is the time to go into your slidos, into the slido and vote on the questions that are there now. And what I'll do is bring up a 
the screen with the Slido in it. Where am I going to do that? Here we go. And we'll see some of the top questions pop up. And I'm going to invite our, all of our panelists to, uh, uh, to show your video if you like. And we're just gonna go based on the popularity of the questions. So uh, these questions are really open to anybody on the panel. What kind of appetite do we see for solutions that remove these floodgates and create more natural flood mitigation strategies? like living dikes or allowing floods? I can take that one. <laughs> yeah, please do. So, Go ahead, Carrie. I, I think the problem here is on, on these watersheds, there's more than one user. And a lot of these floodgates are not just for flood protection, but they're also for the keeping uh, saline water away from fresh. So in Surrey, a lot of ours have to do with farmers and people with water rights for irrigation that's controlled by the province not the city that have licenses upstream of our floodgates so i can't just get rid of these barriers because that will affect their water rights so it's a fine line sometimes of uh, competing interests and also others having jurisdictional rights over a local government that make the decisions on these bigger items. Yeah, does anyone else have some, um, some things to add from your own perspectives? I'll add something if you like, Dan. Um, from a New Zealand perspective, people are generally quite willing to look and run a short test to see what might happen, but there's not a great appetite to actually get rid of things. Um, and that's only going to change if people are made to change. Uh, it largely just comes down to that's my farm. If you flood it, then I have no livelihood, um, which requires some much larger conversations. To yeah. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah. Any other responses to that? I think I think Dan, you could probably add to that as well from what you've been working on for the last year. But I think you know there's an appetite, but it's expensive and and it's difficult. Yeah, it really, and I think the questions really speak to the need for us to to have a, a follow up workshop on this kind of issue that uh, gets to some of the more nitty gritties. Uh, this workshop was particularly technical in nature. Um, and that's because we know that the technicality, the technical part of it is still an issue. So um, it's something that you can do in a bite-sized chunk like this kind of a short webinar. Uh, when you get into these big conversations about appetites and you get into the cross-sectoral nature of these conversations, then it can get quite complex, but that's what we are working on. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to move us on to our next question. Uh, so this one would be particular to, to Canada and probably lower mainland. So under Canadian Fisheries Act, minister can issue orders to remove or modify obstructions that prevent free passage of fish. Ever, have these ever been used for flood infrastructure? Not that I've ever heard of in the lower Fraser, at least. So it would be it would be very difficult, considering you know the the flood. You still have to worry about the flood aspect, so you, it would be very difficult to do that. I think. I've only heard it done with culverts, because um, quite often, if you're redoing a road or something like that, and you're changing out a culvert, you have to make it fish passable, and so I've seen it on 
quite a few culverts at the time. And then even when you're doing your new pump station, uh, yeah, you're, you don't get your permits unless you can show it's, it's better for fish passage. There we go, yeah, thanks. Suzanne just chimed in uh, that this, uh, Suzanne Thorpe from DFO just chimed in on chat. This portion of the act is seldomly used. Uh, maybe this is a little bit of a teaser for next week because we'll be hearing from uh, Danica and Prustage uh, and the Transcoastal Adaptation folks in Nova Scotia, and they might have a, a slightly different answer. So I'll just leave that as a teaser. I think we, we could probably hear a lot from Danica on some of these things too, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll call that one complete and move on to our next. So any ideas on how to reduce flow velocities when gates open might tie into good ideas to improve overall water quality over time. And that is for BAM. Um, yes, um, well, uh, at our location, uh, which I presented is that uh, the water velocity is depending on the tidal um, cycle. So with low water or uh, ebbing, the, the, the gates are opened and uh, the water will be flushed into the water sea. Uh, it's a natural process. What you can do and what they already did is uh, not reduce flow velocities but to uh, open the gates earlier uh, at a equal level, water level. So the water level at the lake is a fixed level and the water level in the sea is a tidal uh, depending on the tide. Um, so if they, they in, in a normal situation, they open the gates when the, the water level of the sea is always lower compared to the, the water level in the lake. So the direction of the water flow is always directed to the sea. In that way, they prevent to uh, salt water coming into the freshwater lake. But they decided to test something and to uh, open the gates a little bit earlier. So you, for fish, uh, fish then uh, the water velocities are then uh, of course uh, lower or, or zero and fish can reach the freshwater lake and then the water is um, uh, is uh, going to a lower water point and then water velocity will increase uh, so you can't uh, reduce flow velocities but you can um, increase time window for fish uh, to reach the freshwater lake and of course, salt water will go into the lake. And they, they um, I didn't present that, but they installed large tubes <laughs> to pump the salt water out of the lake into the water sea again. Um, so that's, that's a solution. But uh, I'm really wondering if they pump the fish that <laughs> reached the first water lake right direct into the sea again. <laughs> but uh, they didn't test that uh, still. So. Uh, do any other speakers have a response to that? Thanks for that, Ben. Um, ideas on how to reduce flow velocities. I don't know about ideas, but I think one thing you need to consider is when are the fish actually migrating in? And Ben showed some evidence from his that for the likes of glass eels and certainly some of our species here, they migrate on the inflowing tide. So the key thing is actually about ensuring that those gates are open on the incoming tide. And that's often, you know, when they shut fairly quickly as the tide changes. So it's actually thinking about the time that it needs to be open, not just the velocity itself. And also, what I also did in the Netherlands is to not fully open the gates, but uh, just uh, the lower part of the gates. So uh, when we have 10 gates, for example, then gate number one and gate number 10 are not fully open, but partially, op partially open. So that may also be a solution, but still the water velocity direct under the gates will be really high. Uh, uh, That's an interesting idea to have uh, multiple gates and you can get multiple flows, I suppose. Yeah. 
All right. Thanks for that. Okay, uh, maybe we'll do, let's see how we do with one more question. Um, this one is for Carrie. Have you done fish sampling observation of the use of the fish ladder and slide scenario? No. <laughs> <laughs> we, we right. all, we've talked about it quite a bit, but nobody's gone out there when we have the big rains and usually we're looking at all the, like, just so you know, our areas are designed to flood too. Uh, like our farmlands do flood in these big rains, but nobody has gone out there when we do have the events to actually do that observations and sampling. Um, it is something we've talked about for years, just haven't done it. All right, so for any academics listening in uh, that are in this area at least, these are some opportunities, right Carrie? Yep. Nice. Okay. Um, how can the scientific community meaningfully articulate to policymakers and local government the importance of changing how we currently use floodplains? So this is a big one. <laughs> this might be one of our ending ones. Uh, there's a lot to dig into here, uh, particularly around the scientific community articulating to policymakers. So who wants to give some feedback on that? John, you've been quiet so far. And Ernie, if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah, I'll come in on that. Um, <clears throat> it's certainly a hard one here because predominantly in the regions where we have pumping stations is because there's quite intensive agriculture. And those areas are very productive lands. And um, I don't think me as a member of the scientific community would be able to convince too many <laughs> policymakers and government that we should get rid of agriculture and Return the return the fields to the to the eels and the fish. It's it's a hard one, and that's um, I'm sure everywhere you know kind of echoes back to one of the earlier questions about multiple stakeholders and who who wins, who has the who plays the trump card and convinces people. So um, we're certainly working hard around the idea that we can try and manage the existing infrastructure to be more fish friendly. I touched on it in my talk that. Um, it feels like for years that these these structures have just been there to move water around. You know, water is the enemy. Pumps pumps are there to move water, and not a complete disregard for fish, but they've certainly not been at the forefront of the thinking. And so, a lot of the things we're trying to deal with are modifying the operations of the structures so they are either if they are fish friendly structures or they have sluice gates that and it goes back to what was being talked about before with when the gates are open just when they are flood gates is get the timing right you know fish will move, move during a five percent window in the year so make sure the gates are open then they change pumps if they're fish friendly to run at night for example if yours are nocturnal otherwise you're just wasting water you're wasting migration opportunities so just trying to take a more holistic view about you know managing the whole landscape for everything everyone can kind of coexist ideally if we get it right And I know Paul in New Zealand. Oh, yeah, in New Zealand, you said that uh, they had just kind of moved towards uh, more regulation around this, similar to what we have in Canada potentially. And you've been involved in policy. Yeah, I guess we haven't got to that conversation about how we um, change the use of floodplains, um, and but I think those conversations are definitely going to have to start happening in some places, particularly in view to future sea level rise. It's going to get to the point where like, economically it becomes unsustainable to keep maintaining and upgrading these systems in perpetuity. You know, it will just become unviable, but um, we have made some inroads recently in terms of strengthening the policy, particularly around new structures that are going in and um, the rules that came in literally two weeks ago, the government announced new policy in this space. And um, that, that really led on from a process that's been going on for the last probably five years 
um, where we've sort of brought together various of the key stakeholders and that's both getting the ecologists and the engineers and some of the planning and policy people into the same room and trying to get everyone to understand what the problem is and why it's actually important and the fact that we can design structures in a way that they have far less impact um, but the problem you've got is there's a lot of existing infrastructure a lot of it has been there for decades um, you know New Zealand is often only a few decades because it's not a very old country but you know Europe you're often hundreds of years almost um, and so the land use, the infrastructure and so on is embedded in that long-standing history. And so to change that requires really major shifts in policy, but also in society's sort of views and values. Um, and that's certainly not something that we're ever going to change overnight, but we have found that those pictures of all the chopped up eels does help persuade a few policy makers to do things differently. Once they start seeing this is actually the problem that you need to deal with. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Just to just to hi, 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 Dan, it's Ernie Victor. Yeah, go ahead, Ernie. Yeah. Yeah, so just a little example of what we're doing here in the Fraser Valley. I'm working with with a number of um cities. Um, we we started this um, process with the provincial government and and the federal government and local cities. It's a collaborative collaborative stewardship forum, and in the forum we've we've created a partnership and, and it's based under understandings that we that we that we want to work together for a certain goal, and getting into um, use, using not using your jurisdiction or your boundary your town line. As a, as a barrier to to change what you're doing and how it affects the, the next city's town or maybe the next reserves town. Um, so so there, there's there's these new forums where there's um, multiple stakeholders levels of government um, getting involved with with a common common goal, and thus you know we're we're in a process of changing legislation, you know how how we're dealing with certain aspects that that were put as a priority. That we can agree on as a priority and so so getting getting along and then putting jurisdiction aside um finding common common platforms to work towards those goals is, is kind of where what we're doing right now and floodgates is not one but we're doing some bank stabilization stuff for for flood for flood mitigation and um some clean water objectives and stuff like that with cities and this is, is coming along it's the first that we've um been involved with as first nations um and you realize that a lot of the federal and provincial governments don't even work together either and yet they have the same responsibility or similar responsibilities so so this interjurisdictional approach is probably a, a good way forward that's great ernie um i feel like that uh, is such a good ending note it's such like a holistic answer to this much a bigger problem than just the technical aspect of it um, and in thinking about about this like the barriers uh, are much more than physical there are many metaphysical barriers uh, in, in culture and in policy and in the jurisdictions like you're talking about those are mental barriers in a lot of cases um, that we've uh, imagined um, so I just want to carry us through to the end here. I really want to thank everyone for your great questions. Um, just want to highlight that uh, we'll be having another solutions workshop next week on June 26th. We'll be uh, having Chief Harley Chapel of Semiamu First Nation, Sarah Nathan from Ducks Unlimited, uh, Jenna Friebel uh, in the Skagit, Skagit Drainage and Irrigation District Consortium, Danica Van Frustig, Transcoastal Adaptation in Nova Scotia, Bob Rutherford, who works with Danica, a Thomas, uh, environmental consultant, also in Nova Scotia. Uh, and in late July or August, actually I can confirm, it's July 24th. I forgot to update the slide. So we will be having another one on July 24th. 
uh, that will be focusing more on prioritization methods that will be welcoming the Canadian Wildlife Federation and their BC and National Fish Passions Program. Uh, Riley Finn, who works with Dave Scott uh, at Rain Coast uh, and is also at UBC uh, and working on lower Fraser prioritization, and Dion Buncha from Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance on their Climate Adapt program. Uh, and I'll be sending a feedback survey around shortly. Uh, I just want to say quickly uh, thanks to our funders, uh, Fish, uh, the Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund with DFO, Pacific Salmon Foundation, thanks to our team. Uh, Pearson Ecological, uh, Kerwood Lydell, and Watershed Watch who uh, support us here. Um, and thank you so much to all of our speakers and all of you for attending. This was, a, a, I hope, a helpful session for you all. I'll be sending around a recording link as well to everyone to share beyond and uh, along with some of the extra links. And thanks so much. We'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Dan, for organizing your everything. Very welcome. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Kim.